Hey guys, Liz here from the Actually Tiny House Project, where we are exploring smart, simple, sustainable tiny house design and giving you some building tips along the way. This video is the third video in our series on tiny house electrical. In the last two videos, you saw Brian talk about sizing the service for a tiny house and also wiring up a service panel. And today, I'm going to talk about planning the circuits for your living area and also some tools and tips for running your wire. But before we get started, I want to make it super clear that I am not a licensed electrician and nothing I say today should be taken as official electrical advice. Wiring a tiny house is a huge responsibility and even one small mistake can create a life-threatening safety hazard. So if you decide to tackle the wiring in your tiny house, it is always a good idea to have an electrician check your work. And if you don't feel 100% comfortable doing this work yourself, just pay a professional to do it for you. So let's talk about circuits. I think one of the challenges of designing a wiring plan for something like a tiny house is that you're talking about something that's not really a house, but also not really an RV. It's something that kind of borrows from both. And so you see most tiny houses these days being wired up a lot like residential construction, but they're also being fed by 50 amp or 30 amp or even 20 amp service, a lot more like an RV. And there's no real code specific to tiny houses yet. So we feel like it's best practice to follow National Electric Code, but where you see that start to break down is when you're talking about the number of circuits serving the space, because National Electric Code is really designed for much larger structures, not something where you've got your bathroom, your kitchen, your living area, and your sleeping area all in a 160 square foot footprint. So when you're talking about a tiny house, it may make sense to combine some circuits that you would normally see separate in a larger house. But if you do that, you really need to be mindful of the load that you're putting on any individual circuit. And that's not to say that you can't just run all of the separate circuits that you would have in normal residential construction. But if you do that, you know, you're going to be drilling a lot more holes and you're going to be pulling a lot more wire. And so, you know, everybody's build is going to be different and I can't tell you what's right for your individual tiny house. But what I'm going to do is walk you through the circuits that we've put into this house and explain some of the thinking about the choices that we made. Now coming out of my service panel here, I have two GFCI protected 20 amp circuits feeding the kitchen area of the tiny house, just like you'd have in any normal kitchen. And this is one of those places where it might have been simpler just to run one circuit feeding this wall, one circuit feeding this wall, but in really thinking about how we like to cook and how we use the space and which appliances we're likely to have running at the same time, it made more sense for us to run one circuit above the counter and one circuit below the counter. Now coming back to this corner here, you'll see that we pulled our bathroom power off of one of those same small appliance circuits. And the reason for that is that the wire was already in this location, it was the correct size, and it was already protected by a GFCI. So coming over to this side of the tiny house, we have one 15 amp AFCI protective breaker that serves the lights and the outlets in the living space. And then we have another dedicated 20 amp circuit that feeds an outdoor outlet that'll be GFCI protected. And you might notice that this is actually run on 10 gauge wire. This is just repurposed from when we were originally going to run 30 amp service to the tiny house, but it's totally fine to put a smaller circuit on a larger wire and leaving this in place just gives us some versatility in the future if we decide to change things up. All right, so our final circuit here is just a dedicated 30 amp circuit feeding our water heater. And now our water heater is a bit of a unique situation for a tiny house because we're installing a hybrid solar and wood fired hot water system and that requires a large reservoir and at that point it just made sense to wire up the elements inside of that existing tank and so it's an interesting situation because most of the time our water is going to be heated by the sun or by waste heat off of the wood stove but in the times that we do need an electric backup that backup had to be a little bit bigger size now if we weren't installing a system like this, we would just have a dedicated 20 amp circuit here feeding a smaller tanked water heater. Now, regardless of the size of your water heater, a thing that makes a lot of sense inside of a tiny house is to have your water heater on a switch because that allows you to use it when you need it, but to not have this high load being continuously drawn off of your already limited service. So once I've got my circuit plan, the first thing I do is I walk around the space with a roll of blue tape and I just mark out where I'm going to want my switches, where I'm going to want my outlets. And that gives me a chance to really think about the space and how I'm using the space. But it also gives me a chance to sort of double check my thinking on my circuit plan to see if there's anything that I missed. And once I'm confident that I've got that pretty well dialed in, I walk around again and I think about the wiring runs and how they're going to serve each of those boxes. And at that point, I might shift some things around so that, you know, I've got boxes in line in a single stud bay and I can just run a wire to both of them or so that I'm limiting the number of holes that I'm drilling in the wall. 
So when I'm thinking about drilling the holes for my wiring runs, I really like to keep things as simple as possible because when you're talking about something like a tiny house where you have two by four walls and two by six ceiling rafters, well, too many holes or too big holes could potentially create a structural issue. Now, that's not to say you wanna do the opposite and drill just tiny holes and just jam a ton of wires through them. It's really about finding a balance between appropriately sized holes with an appropriate number of wires in them and being mindful of the number of holes you're putting through your walls overall. Now, the location of your wiring run is also a good thing to think about. Code requires your electrical to be run above your plumbing, but I still like to run my electrical pretty low in the wall because even though this should all be protected by nail plates, it's still just good extra insurance that in the future, nobody's gonna put a nail through a wire when they're trying to hang a picture. And to that end, it's just a good idea to wait to do all of this electrical work until all of your exterior sheathing and siding work is done. Because even though appropriately sized fasteners for that kind of work shouldn't hit the middle of a two by four stud, things do happen and it's better to just not have to worry about it. And so the last thing I like to do before I start pulling my wire is just walk around the room one more time, measure up from the floor and mark all the locations for my box, keeping everything at a uniform height. And this just saves me time later when I'm installing the boxes so I'm not stopping to measure each individual one. And then I also measure and mark for the holes I need to drill for my wiring runs. And I like to make a note on the stud which circuits I'm gonna be pulling through which holes just to keep myself organized later as I move through the room. So let's take a look at the tools I use to do my wiring rough in. Now, I like to keep my tools organized in a couple bins because that just makes it easy for me to keep them with me as I move throughout the space. And this just saves me a lot of time too because I'm not constantly getting up and walking across the room to find another tool. All right, so let's look in the bin. So first up, I've just got a standard 18 volt cordless drill for drilling my wiring runs. And to go with that, I've got a couple different kinds of drill bits. So first off, I've got an auger bit. And what an auger bit is, is it's got this special tip on it that helps to pull the bit really rapidly through the wood. And you're not gonna see this in like fine woodworking because it makes a really messy hole, but it is really great for just chewing through your studs. Now, if you don't wanna get an auger bit, Another option is a spade bit. And spade bits will make the holes just fine, but you're gonna be working a bit harder. And that's where the auger bit is really nice, especially when you're up on a ladder and you're really reaching. But the good thing about spade bits is that if you've got a really narrow space between a couple of studs, you can knock them off with an angle grinder and make yourself just a little mini bit. And you know, putting this in this drill, now you can get inside a stud bay as small as 10 inches, which could save you from having to get something like a right angle drill. And this is something that's worth talking about, just thinking about your electrical run from the beginning. I mean, if you can plan your electric as you're planning the framing of your house, you can make sure that you can get your drill in to drill all of your holes because there's nothing worse than backing yourself into a corner and not being able to drill out for your wiring runs or forcing you to have to go and buy a much more expensive tool like a right angle drill. So this is a right angle drill, super beefy tool, will drill holes in very tight stud bays, but it is pricey and I'm a big fan of not having to buy tools that you don't really need. So next up, I've just got some Sharpies for marking things out. I've got my hammer for nailing on my boxes and also my staples. And I like to have a little mini hammer with me as well because sometimes I can get this guy into awkward little spaces that I can't get this one in. Um, I've also got just a standard flathead screwdriver. This is really useful both for popping the tabs on the back of the electrical boxes and also for backing any staples out if I've made a mistake. And lastly, I've just got a cable stripper. So those are my tools. So also in my bin, I've got my wire. So here I've got some just 14-2 and 12-2. Those are probably what you're most likely going to be working with. And a handy thing to just talk about is, you know, when you're unspooling this wire, you don't want to just go like that. That's just going to cause all kinds of problems for you while you're trying to pull it through the walls. You really want to just carefully unwind it and actually unspool it as you go and that's going to make your life a lot easier because that's going to stay nice and straight. Now another thing when it comes to wire is that when I cut this off, if I've got a little bit extra, if I've pulled a little bit too much, I just keep all of those tails, I stick them back in the bin because I'm gonna use these to make my pigtails later and that way I'm just not wasting a ton of wire. 
And so the next thing I've got in my box is my boxes. And you know, if you go to the hardware store, you're gonna see tons of these little blue boxes, all different kinds. And there's just a lot of different options out there. Right now, I really like these ones that have both this fin and their standard nail on. Um, I think you're actually supposed to just use one or the other, but I actually like to use both because it gives me just a super positive attachment to the wall. And these are also just a little bit deeper than your sort of your normal single gang box. Um, so you can, you just got a little more room to work with there. And they have these really positive strain reliefs on the back. You know, usually what you see in these boxes are just little tabs that either pop out completely or they kind of bend forward. But this has a three prong strain relief built into it, which is just really nice, especially when you're talking about something like a tiny house where there's going to be vibration when it's moved. Now, that said, you know, as far as this two gang box goes that has the fin, but it doesn't have those nail ons, you know, when I put this on the wall, this flexed so much that it was just a nightmare to work with. So I would watch out for things like these. And that's really something that if you're not familiar with the boxes, you don't think about, but the easier it is to nail it on and have it just stay really firmly where you have nailed it on makes your life so much easier when it comes to sheathing your walls. Because the last thing you want is a kind of wobbly box that doesn't go on completely square and then your sheathing is on and you've got you've actually got a box that's tilted out and yeah you just want a really solid positive connection now then one of the beefiest ones out there that you can get and this is actually a really great thing to talk about for tiny houses these are a little bit more expensive but they've got this metal bracket that attaches to the stud and what this is is it's actually got this little screw here and so you can turn this screw and you can adjust the depth of your box within the wall. And where this is especially nice for something like tiny house is if you don't know yet what you're gonna sheath your interior walls with, if you haven't made a decision between like drywall or you don't know how deep your shiplap or something is gonna be, you can install these and then you have the freedom to be able to adjust the depth of them later. Whereas, you know, these boxes are just designed for your sort of standard sheetrock depth. And the last thing I like to have with me in my main bin here is just a copy of my code check. And what these are are just super great little resources. They're inexpensive. They're full of these great diagrams. And it's just basically code distilled down in a really easy to read, easy to reference format. And I like to have this on hand because like I said, I'm not a licensed electrician. And oftentimes when I'm doing electrical work, a lot of time has gone by since the last time I dug into this and I'm not gonna remember everything. So having a reference at hand just makes my life so much easier. So that was my big box. This is my little box. So first up in here, I've got my staples. And you're gonna use staples to fasten your wires to your studs every four feet or within eight inches of a box. And I personally like to staple even a little bit more frequently than that because I feel like it keeps things really tidy, makes it easy for me to see what's going on. And I feel like it makes it a lot easier to insulate around. Now, when you bang these in, you wanna make sure that you're not squashing your wires, they, but they should be held nice and snugly. And personally, I actually like to leave my staples a little bit loose until I'm done with all of my wiring runs because it makes it easier for me to sneak a little bit more wire through there if I need to pull a little more, and it also makes them easier to back out if I've made a mistake. But if you do that, you need to make sure that when you're done, you go back around and hammer everything down until it's being held nice and snug. Now, you wanna make sure that you're using the right size staples for your wire, and you wanna check your local code, but oftentimes you can run two 12 or 14 gauge wires under a single staple, but any more than that, and you need something called a stacker. And these are just these little plastic guys. They nail onto the stud and each wire slips into one of these bays and they clip together like that. So next up, I've got some nail plates and these come in different sizes. And what these are is they just hammer onto the front of the studs to protect the wire that runs through the stud. And code requires these anywhere that you've got a wire that's closer than an inch and a quarter to the front face of the stud. So unless you've made a mistake, you probably don't need these in a two by four wall, but I like to put them on anyway because it's just really cheap insurance to make sure that nothing gets pierced by a stray nail. 
And the last thing I have in my box, which I won't actually be using while I'm roughing in my wire, but I will use later for making up my boxes, are these push connectors. And these come in different sizes and they just take the place of traditional wire nuts. They've got individual holes on the end that the wires just snap into and there's this window on the other end where you can check to see that everything's in place and making a good connection. And some electricians don't like these because they feel like they don't make as solid of a wire to wire connection as a traditional wire nut. But as an amateur, I really like these because they're easy to use. They give me the opportunity to double, to double check my work. And I feel like they provide a much more vibration resistant connection, which is really important in something like a tiny house that might be moved. So before I go, just a few tips for pulling the wire itself. Now, when it comes to my boxes, I like to leave about eight inches of wire coming from the back of the box. It's a little bit more than code requires, but I feel like it's a really useful amount to have to work with. Now, when it comes to pulling the wire itself, like I said before, you don't wanna just do this. You want to actually unspool and unroll the wire as you go, keeping it nice and straight, and that'll make your life just so much easier when you go to pull it through the holes. And when it comes to wiring a long run where you're going around a corner, it's always really hard to just pull wire around a corner. What's much easier is to pull your straight run and then leave a loop of excess at the end and then go back and pull that excess through the next run around the corner. And that'll just save you a ton of frustration. All right, so that is our wiring rough in. Now, like I said before, I am not a professional electrician, so I'm sure there's some things I forgot to mention, and I'm sure there's some things here that could be done a bit more cleanly. So if you are an electrician and you've got some suggestions or comments, please leave those in the comments below. Now, if you wanna check out more of what we do here, you can find us online at actuallytiny.com where we've got a bunch more videos like this and where we're compiling some really great tiny house resources. You can also find us on Instagram at actuallytiny where we post a daily photo blog of our build and time-lapse videos of everything that we do, including one of me wiring up this space. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Have fun building your tiny house.